whenever I'm choosing a new framework, I always ask myself, would a big tech company use this? Will this scale? When my product hits a billion users, is this application going to be able to handle that? Will it have to be rewritten and I'll be the shamed CTO? And I often hear as a Python developer, people always say, oh, Python, you know, frameworks are too slow. I want to build something that's going to be usable when the application scales. So today I wanted to talk about, you know, when your application does scale, what do big companies do? What frameworks have they used? And how have these frameworks held up when company hits 1 billion users, 2 billion users? You know, what happens then? What changes need to be made? Does code need to be rewritten? And when they do rewrite it, do they rewrite it in the same framework that they started with? Interesting questions that we will be answering on today's video. Let's get straight into the content that you are here for and what frameworks our favorite web applications use and how these frameworks essentially handle at scale. Uber has a really cool blog. The engineering blog is really good. If you just want to read about technology and a company's technological evolution just for the fun of it, I would recommend that you read their blog. It's really well documented and they write like they really are passionate just about their tech stack. And so yeah, so now let's get into what it's made up of. So Uber has actually managed to break down their application into microservices to a point where they can actually healthily talk about it. I know for a lot of companies, talking about breaking up your monolith is a bit of a sensitive topic, but Uber is in a good place with their microservices. So initially, Uber was built just in Tornado, which is a Python framework. Everything was in Tornado. However, when they broke it up, they did decide to still keep the Python parts in Python. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> when they broke it up, they still decided to keep some parts in Python. And then the other parts that they felt that could use a bit of a speed booster, they rewrote them in Golang. So the microservices are kind of split up between Python and Golang. For their front end, Uber has stuck to native apps. So they are using native apps as in Android for Java for Android and Swift for iOS development. For their web app, they are using React. They actually do make like packages for React.js. They make some pretty cool stuff for the React community, which I thought was kind of, kind of lovely. They're making like open source contributions. For their database, I found it really interesting. So Uber did start off on Postgres. However, they found that Postgres was not keeping up quite well with their stuff. So they switched over to MySQL and now they're using MySQL and Cassandra. So for their data modeling and some of the stuff where they need high availability and high speed, they use Cassandra. But for stuff that they can use for more structured queries, they're still now using MySQL and their cloud provider is of course AWS no one's leaving AWS anytime soon so yeah their stuff is still deployed on AWS it's probably worth noting that a lot of these companies are using AWS mainly because at the time that they started AWS was probably the only big player in the cloud industry and now moving on to an application that is verified to be a part of the 2 billion users club is WhatsApp. WhatsApp probably has the most interesting tech stack of the applications that we'll be looking at today and I was personally quite fascinated by it. WhatsApp hasn't disclosed if they've moved to React Native so as far as we know all their apps are native so they do use Swift for the iOS application and Java for their Android application. For their backend, WhatsApp uses Xbird. It's an XMP protocol application server that's written in Erlang. So this protocol, so Xbird is kind of like ideal for applications where you have a gazillion users sending each other instant messages concurrently. And for their database, WhatsApp actually does not store your information. WhatsApp doesn't store your messages. All your messages are actually stored on your phone. So they're not storing it on their own like database. So that's why it's important for you to back up your own messages because they don't have backups of your messages. In a world where everyone has so much too much information about you, it's just reassuring that the platform I use the most, the platform I share the most personal information in, is actually not storing my information. It's a tad bit reassuring. <laughs> Instagram stories actually have 
500 million users per day. I actually made a video about creating Instagram filters. You can check that out. They also announced that they hit the 1 billion users club, which is incredibly amazing. But anyway, today we're going to be focusing on Instagram's tech stack. Instagram didn't start on React Native. They did have native applications. However, when React launched, they were one of the first companies to move over to React Native. And their mobile application also is built in React. Remember that Instagram is loyal to Facebook. So obviously they will be using Facebook platforms. For their back end, Instagram still uses Django for the win. I absolutely love Django. I'm a Django developer. It makes me happy. So Instagram does use a Python framework for their back end. They've also moved from REST to GraphQL. GraphQL is also a Facebook technology, but it's probably a really good move because GraphQL is much faster and much more of a pleasure to work with than the REST framework. Instagram's database is made up of Postgres and Cassandra. If you know, if you're a Django developer or a Python developer, you know that Postgres is pretty much the default for structured query database and I'm guessing they use Cassandra mainly for their data modeling so anything that they use for their recommendation stuff any machine learning stuff that they do they will probably using, be using Cassandra for that and I'm pretty sure for their structured create information like posts by users a user's post that kind of stuff is probably using Postgres because it would pretty it would relatively be much easier to still do it in structured query but of course I don't work on Instagram I don't know this is just stuff that they've just shared with Without any specific detail so that's just my assumption the over a billion users platform is running on EC2 so their servers are running on EC2 and their images are all stored on S3 buckets so Instagram is a very hefty client to Jeff Bezos and now moving on to the platform we are currently on it's YouTube YouTube makes Google about like 13 billion dollars a year so they like a huge part of google and it's actually also interesting because it then goes into explaining one of the reasons they may be a bit secretive about their tech stack so youtube has never disclosed what front end they use and for a long time people have suspected that the reason for that is because YouTube does not actually use Angular, right? There's no evidence that YouTube uses Angular. And considering that YouTube is such a big part of Google and probably one of their biggest standalone products, it would be a bit weird that they wouldn't use um, Google's, one of Google's most popular frameworks at the time, some time ago. So for their front end, what they've disclosed is they use JavaScript, obviously, and they have mentioned some required JS, but they haven't gone into specific details of how their front end looks. My guess is they probably are running native apps about 99% sure it's not React Native, but they are probably running native apps. So probably Swift for the iOS and uh, Java for their Android applications. And I'm happy to announce that there's been some evidence that YouTube's uh, backend is written in Django or any other Python framework. Again, any other Python framework for me feels like a personal win just because I'm a Python developer and it makes me happy. For their database, YouTube does use MySQL that has been disclosed. They haven't disclosed what other NoSQL database that they use. It could be Cassandra or Maria or any of the other ones. It's not clear, but I'm quite certain that they use one of the NoSQL databases for their data modeling and their recommendation system, also known as the algorithm. The not so spicy news is that their cloud provider is actually Google Cloud. So yeah, that is to be expected, I think. So they actually moved from AWS to Google Cloud when Google Cloud started taking off because that's what you do when you own a company. You move them over to the service that you're using. And Netflix is doing pretty well for itself, especially considering that the streaming industry for a long time, people believed like, why would I pay for streaming? Because streaming was free. But Netflix has managed to position itself quite nicely in being able to provide a service that was initially free and moving it to something that's completely paid. And that's also some, something that YouTube is moving towards. YouTube is now trying to move into the space of paid subscriptions. And I'm just interested in seeing if they'll find that sweet spot that Netflix has kind of landed itself on. But enough of that politics and marketing and more into the technical aspect of Netflix. So Netflix's front end is built in React.js, the Netflix app, the Netflix website that you see 
is react.js and their back end is built in flask which is a python framework python for the win once again and their the their database is post postgres and cassandra and their cloud provider obviously can you guess that it is definitely aws and yeah that pretty much sums it up remember to subscribe to my channel anyway subscribe to my channel i appreciate it and happy quarantining i'll see you in the next video